Higurashi when they cry needs no introduction, not on this channel nor in general since it's remake, wait no actually it's a sequel, what's going on? Exploded onto the scene back in October. Still, if you are here without knowing what it is, allow me to direct you to my spoiler free guide to the series found here. On the contrary, if after finishing the series Higurashi has yet to relinquish its grip on you, look no further. The purpose of this video is twofold. To introduce the many bonus arcs, stories and other oddities on offer, and to help you decide which ones might be worth your time. As such, there will be no spoilers for the arcs I discuss in the video, though it will be assumed you finished the original 8. This is your last chance to turn back if you don't want the original story spoiled. There will also be no mention of anything that doesn't come explicitly under the Higurashi title, so again, see my other guide video for discussions of other When They Cry titles, and don't expect any of these to come up. You can also see my video on the many adaptations that the original story has received for those. The last thing to mention is that the availability of these arcs wildly varies, and enough of them were never released outside of Japan for it to be redundant to mention every time. Known fan translations will, however, be linked in the description. All good? Let's begin. There's a lot to get through. To the best of my knowledge, the very first of Higurashi's now sprawling list of bonus arcs to ever be released was Oni Sarashihen, or the Demon Exposing chapter, back in 2006. This came as a two volume manga exclusive arc following the series' complete adaptation into that format, an adaptation I highly recommend. Oni Sarashi, like most of the main Higurashi manga, is legally available in English if you can find it. The Higurashi manga utilised a number of different artists, with this particular entry being illustrated by N. Kito. The story is credited to Ryukishi Zero Nana, or Ryukishi Zero Seven, the author of the main series, but was ultimately a collaboration between the two, as is the case for many of the arcs on this list. Onyu Sadashi follows the first of many additional characters introduced to the series via these side entries, Natsumi Kimiyoshi. Natsumi is a distant relative of the Kimiyoshi we know, the mayor of Hinamizawa, and is also thus a member of one of the village's three families, but grew up in Okinomiya and has recently moved away to the city of Kakiuchi. The story explores how the gas disaster in Hinamizawa ripples out to impact Natsumi's life and ultimately change it forever. Onyusarashi is a solid arc. It deals with Higurashi's typical intersecting themes of family breakdowns, mental illness, crime and discrimination very effectively, and while the pacing does suffer slightly as a result of its being a relatively short story, those looking for a solid piece of horror and mystery writing won't be disappointed. I particularly recommend the arc to those who enjoyed Onikakushi. Don't make any decisions yet though, as it was later adapted into two visual novel arcs which I'll come to a bit later. Lastly, Oni Sarashi comes with the typical content warnings for visual depictions of graphic violence, as well as brief scenes of animal abuse. Nekokoro Shihen, or the Cat Killing Chapter, was the first of four original light novels by Dukishi that were released in addition to the series' complete adaptation into that format. The arc was later made into a special during the Higurashi Kai anime. In Nekogoroshi, the club visit the abandoned neighbouring town of Yagochi after school, where Mion recounts a strange story from her childhood, which ultimately provides a clue as to the conspiracy at play behind the supposed gas disaster. The arc acts as a hint for fans going into the second season, so there's not much to be gained from watching it after completing the series unless you're looking for a little extra content of the club. Two thousand and six was a busy year for Higurashi, with a slew of new releases accompanying the series' new anime. Amongst these was Higurashi Daybreak, a third-person shooter made by the Dojin developer Twilight Frontier for Microsoft Windows, later ported to PSP. 
In Daybreak, Luca happens across a pair of Magatama which will cause the person who is in possession of one to fall in love with the person in possession of the other. The characters thus form teams of two and face off, with the winners getting to keep the Magatama. With various ending cutscenes to unlock, Daybreak actually has a lot of really cute scenarios exploring different characters' relationships, romantic or otherwise. The game also got two spin-off manga which are adorable in their own right, but Daybreak's story eventually became the basis for an arc of its own, so I'll talk about that in a bit. Lastly, the game's two respective PSP releases each came packaged with two pretty silly drama CDs, under the titles of Kimi Koi Shihen, or the Loving You chapter, and Sachi Saga Shihen, or the Fortune Searching chapter, wherein Keiichi falls in love with Oryo and the club form a band. Kataribana Shihen, or the Anthology chapter, was the result of a competition wherein fans submitted stories to 7th Expansion, from which multiple were picked and adapted by Ryukishi into three light novels, a further seven volumes of manga, and various drama CDs. There are way too many of these to go through here, with stories ranging in tone from Skekoma Shihen, or the Lady Killing chapter, wherein Keiichi accidentally drinks a love potion and wreaks havoc amongst his friend group, to Limit, which explores Shion's jealousy towards Keiichi and Mion's relationship to the end of a tragedy not unlike Meakashi's. Needless to say, if you can get your hands on any of Kataribanashi, it's plenty worth doing, as there's lots of great stuff in here and certainly something for everyone. 2006 came to an end with the release of Higodashi Re, or Higodashi Gratitude, a disc repackaging the original eight PC arcs with a further three. While these arcs are still awaiting an official English release as part of Manga Gamer's whole package, Day also has an anime OVA adaptation of the same name, which was released in 2009. Day's main event comes in the form of Sai Koroshihen, or the Dice Killing chapter, Higurashi's ninth chapter or epilogue. The arc takes place two months after Matsuribayashi, and involves Rika getting into a car accident and waking up once again in June 1983. What she quickly realises is that this is not the same Hinamizawa as the one she had left. Saikoroshi ultimately confronts Rika with the impact of her 100 year journey on her psyche and attitude towards life. In what is both some of my absolute favourite writing in all of Higurashi, and a necessary read to truly complete the series. It's an arc I'll probably talk about in the detail it deserves at a later point, but suffice it to say this is the first place I'd direct anyone who has just finished the series. While the visual novel version is my top recommendation, Sai Koroshi also has a solid manga adaptation legally available in English, and the three episode version of the arc found in the day OVA is serviceable. Higurashi Day's other two arcs are the first of Higurashi's many fan service arcs, hereby meaning arcs that don't necessarily contribute anything meaningful to the story and are mostly just a bit of fun. Contrary to popular belief, many of these arcs are plenty worth experiencing, but Batsu Koishihen or the penalty loving chapter is not one of them. Batsu Koishi first featured as a short epilogue to Meakashi, before swiftly being removed after it became apparent this was about the most tonally dissonant thing you could possibly put after this. Yes, Batsu Koishi formed the basis for the utterly infamous and widely reviled later first episode of the Higurashi Kira OVA, wherein Keiichi and the self-titled Soul Brothers essentially just imagine the entire female cast in various highly inappropriate situations. The less that's said about this one, the better, and while the original visual novel version of the arc is a lot tamer, Dukishi's willingness to have his underage characters depicted in these kinds of scenarios remains Higurashi's fatal flaw as a series, and the source of many a headache for me as its fan. Hirokawashi Hen, or the Daybreak chapter, then, is a decidedly unremarkable arc that I'll happily take over its predecessor. This is the arc inspired by the Daybreak games, though in this case, Rena actually swallows one of the magical Magatama, leading to various escapades as its paired piece makes its way around Hinamizawa, and the club try to track it down before Rena makes a harem of the entire village. Both Hidokoashi and Batsu Koishi received manga adaptations, and Hidokoashi also featured as the final episode of the Higurashi Day OVA. 
It has some slightly weird moments but also a lot of laughs so there's certainly no harm in checking this one out if you're looking for some light-hearted Higurashi content, though it places fairly low on my personal ranking of the series offerings in this regard. Moving into 2007, two new Higurashi arcs were released exclusively for iMode phones, which yeah, I'd never heard of them either. Near Sagashihen, or the Sacrifice Searching chapter, introduced a number of new characters, seemingly exclusive to these arcs, with a focus on a private detective who visits Hinamizawa to investigate the disappearance of a reporter who had been covering the dam site dismemberment murder. The arc advertised itself as something of an adventure game and had seven different endings. Kokorokuzushihen, or the heartbreaking chapter then, works as the corresponding answer arc, telling the story from the perspective of Inoue Wakaba, a young girl who moved to Hinamizawa to live with a relative following the death of her parents, and who had known the reporter who went missing. These are some of the most obscure entries on this list, and this is about all I know about either of them. 2007 also brought us a fantastic addition to the Higurashi manga in the form of Yoigoshihen, or the Beyond Midnight arc, this time illustrated by Mimori. Yoigoshi, spanning two volumes, is set in an alternate Sumihoroboshihen-esque world where Rena succeeds in blowing up the school. The story picks up 23 years later in 2006 and follows another group of new characters as they cross paths in the now abandoned Hinamizawa. Each of the group carry with them a reason for coming to the village, and an inner conflict which must be resolved by daybreak. Oh, and one of them has the name of one of the girls who died in the school hostage situation. I've spoken about Yoigoshi on my channel before, but let me take yet another opportunity to wholeheartedly recommend it. This is one of my absolute favourite Higurashi bonus arcs, and not just because it acts in my mind as the Mion-centric arc we never quite got in the original series. It is a must-read at the least for anyone who numbers the twins amongst their favourite Higurashi characters, but also presents an experience entirely compelling in its own right. Yoigoshi is stunningly atmospheric, set as it is in a ghost town with a reputation amongst occult enthusiasts, and the group's fear and suspicion of one another hang heavy over the work. This is of course to say nothing of the emotion evoked by joining Mion on her journey. The relatively short story does a great job of developing both its lead Akira Otobe and his relationship with Mion whilst the equally fantastic visual novel version of the arc focuses on journalist Ryunosuke Arakawa and the newly added Miyuki Sorimachi, Akasaka's adult daughter. Between Mimori's breathtaking artwork and some of Satsuki Ukino's best work for Higurashi to date, it's very much worth reading both versions of the arc, and the manga is legally available in English. Yoigoshi is ultimately both a true love letter to Mion as a character, and a unique and wonderful entry to the Higurashi canon in its own right that all fans owe it to themselves to experience. Following the success of the original PC release, Higurashi got its first ever console port to PlayStation 2 under the title of Higurashi no Nakukoro ni Matsuri, or Festival. Matsuri carried arcs 1 through 7, a new ending to replace Matsuri Ryashihen, and two further new arcs. Various other changes came in the form of new music, artwork, full voice acting, and even branching stories dictated by choices. As many will already know, these console benefits are what 7th Mod have lifted to create the popular patch they offer. The first of Matsuri's additional arcs was Tadai Mawashihen. Tadai Mawashi is a Japanese idiom meaning to pass the basin around, or to avoid a necessary but unpleasant task by passing the responsibility on to another. Tadai Mawashi, as is the case for all of the original console bonus arcs I'll talk about, was overseen by Rukishi but written by Kano Kichi. This short arc explores what would happen if, contrary to his actions in the other question arcs, Keiichi simply ignored any signs that something might be amiss in Hinimizawa, and was originally accessed by failing to make the choices that corresponded with the events of Onikakushi. Tadai Mawashi essentially just acts as an extended bad ending, and you don't really miss out on anything from not reading it. This is one for the completionists. 
The second dark Matsuri added was Suki Otoshi Hen, translated most commonly as the Exorcism Chapter. This was first placed between Meakashi and Sumihoro Boshi, but was later moved to be included as one of the question arcs. Tsuki Otoshi acts as a what-if scenario wherein Tepe comes back to Hinamizawa and Rene, Keiichi and Shion decide to work together to save Satoko, but quickly become ensnared in a web of paranoia and suspicion towards one another. The trio's dynamic is an interesting one, and for that reason I think Tsuki Otoshi had a lot of potential, but it ultimately became a testament to what a lot of people seem to think Higurashi is. Namely, a bunch of characters who have gone off the deep end, crammed together with the end result of a lot of bloodshed. It does have its moments, but Suki Otoshi most often feels distinctly heavy-handed, in comparison to the kind of horror Higurashi usually offers. This is a series I appreciate for how it walks the tightrope that is, ensuring its cruelty is always justified. And Suki Otoshi is one of my least favourite arcs on this list for how I feel it breaks that rule. It seems to relish a little too much in its depravity, and it really does the character's typical complexity a disservice in the process. It's notably shorter than the typical Higurashi arc, which doesn't do its pacing any favours, but also means it's not too much of a commitment for anyone masochistic enough to read it. Just be forewarned you're in for a rough ride and not much to reward you for your efforts. Fortunately, Matsuri's final offering is a markedly more enjoyable one, Miyotsuku Shihen. The name draws on both the kanji used to refer to a kind of navigational marker that indicates the movement of a channel of water, and the phrase Miyotsukusu, meaning to give one's all. The arc I'll be talking about here is now known specifically by the title of Miyotsukushi o Mote. Miyotsukushi functions as an alternate ending to the series replacing Matsuribayashi in multiple console versions of the game, despite not actually being written by Rikishi. It's also one of the longest arcs in the series, thrusting Rika into a scenario where she is forced to confront every major obstacle that has hindered her in her hundred year journey before she can finally grasp her happy ending. I'll get it out of the way now and say that Matsuribayashi is my preferred ending to Higurashi, and one of my favourite arcs in general due to how impressively and comprehensively it resolves the series' many established mysteries, plot threads, and conversations around the concepts of sin and self-acceptance. It is, for me, the ending that best aligns with and brings home the themes Higurashi contends with, and is thus the one I find most satisfying. That does not, however, mean that I think Miyotsukushi is anything less than another must-read for any Higurashi fan. While Matsuribayashi takes a more wide-angle view of the story, Miyotsukushi keeps its focus firmly on the club. It affords each member of our main cast an opportunity to contend with the struggles that have defined their arcs, and demonstrates the strength of the bonds they have forged over the course of this story in the process. While Kano Kichi's character writing does stumble at times in arcs like Tsuki Otoshi, he far more often shows an understanding of Higurashi's cast that makes clear exactly why he has earned Rukishi's blessing, and remained as one of the series' key figures for over a decade. Miyotsukushi isn't perfect, and would likely feel somewhat incomplete and confusing if read instead of rather than after Matsuribayashi. Major omissions are made in the form of things like Takano's backstory, and some of the series' best scenes are lost in the process. But the arc functions fantastically as an additive experience, and equally has many a scene I'd have loved to have had in Matsuribayashi. Two relationships this arc lends particular focus to are Keiichi and Rika's and Keiichi and Mion's. As the series' two protagonists, it's immensely gratifying finally getting to see Keiichi and Rika work together and rely on one another, and to see how much each has grown since the start of the series in the process. As for Keiichi and Mion, let's just say if you're a fan of the pairing and you haven't read this arc yet, I don't know what you're doing still listening to me. True to the original, Keiichi and Mion's developing relationship makes sure never to overshadow their individual development, but rather lends to it. And while I'm personally inclined to prefer Matsuribayashi in this regard too, others may find in Miyotsukushi the more overt conclusion to Mion's character arc the original had left them wanting for. Needless to say, Miyotsukushi is one of my highest recommendations from this list for any and all fans. 
As a final note, 7th Mod also offer a translation of the less recent PS2 version of this arc, wherein there are various minor changes and one big plot twist. I've included further information about this in the description. Matsuri was also bundled with a new light novel written by Rikishi titled Haji Sarashihen, or simply The Embarrassment Chapter. Haji Sarashi is literally just Higurashi's pool episode, though it largely focuses on the club's ridiculous antics over actual fan service. This arc is also now available as a drama CD, was later added into the console games, and was adapted as the first episode of the Higurashi Day OVA. It is actually quite funny, so check it out if you'd like. Following Matsuri, two very short stories were released in the magazine Dengeki G's Festival. Hashi Watashihen, or the bridge building chapter, is told from Mion's perspective shortly after Keiichi has transferred into Hinamizawa, but I could not find anything about Nashi Kuzushihen, or the growing unbalanced chapter, so that one remains a mystery. Rukishu similarly compiled a further two light novels under the title of Kuradashihen, or the delivery chapter around this time in order to share various ideas and alternative scenarios that hadn't made it into the main series. Two examples being a version of Tatarigoroshi wherein Shion survives the disaster and visits Keiichi in hospital, or a version of Himatsu Bushi wherein Akasaka learns of Yukie's death while still in Hinamizawa and reaches level 5 of the Hinamizawa syndrome as a result. It's similarly hard to find much about these short of buying them though. Lest we forget, 2007 also brought us the Higurashi Kai anime, and with it yet another new arc in the form of Yakusamashihen, or the Disaster Awakening chapter. Yakusamashi is the four-episode arc that precedes Minagoroshi, broadly intended to incorporate various details of the plot and mystery missed out in the anime's first season, and follows Satoko as she tries to work out why Rika has been acting strangely. Yakusamashi is a welcome, if heart-wrenching, exploration of Satoko and Rika's relationship, and how the events of June 1983 play out from the perspective of somebody who has no idea what's coming, seemingly drawing from parts of Taraimawashi, but ultimately bringing the tragedy home far more effectively. It's a heavily melancholic and foreboding piece that sets up Minagoroshi perfectly, teasing both Rika's ultimate role in the story and her resulting struggles with depression. The way Yakusamashi explores Satoko's realisation of the enforced distance between her and Rika, and the impact this realisation has on her, frankly feel more relevant now than ever. Due to its anime original status, Yakusamashi has none of the pacing issues otherwise typical of the Higurashi anime, and is a point in the adaptation's favour as a great addition to anyone's first experience of the story, but it's plenty worth checking out even after you're done, especially in light of recent developments. 2007 also saw the commencement of Higurashi Radio, a now sprawling endeavour consisting of multiple CDs and web radio shows, wherein either the characters or the actual cast just talk, sometimes interspersed with mini skits. These don't really fit in with what I'm talking about here, but do fall under the Hen title bracket, so I'm just mentioning what they are for clarity's sake. This is, however, a good opportunity to plug Red-Eyed Serpent's channel, a fan who has been translating various clips from both these and the drama CD adaptation of the series I so often rave about. I've lent them copies of various discs I own that I'd never have gone to the effort of translating myself, so do consider checking out their channel for lots of great content. Also beginning serialization in 2007 was Utsutsu Koashihen, or the reality-breaking chapter, another manga-exclusive arc illustrated by Enkito, set during Shion's time at St. Lucia as she befriends a mysterious fellow student by the name of Mitsuho Kosaka amidst a series of murders taking place at the school. Having read what does exist of the arc, it was shaping up to be pretty interesting and a nice bit of further insight into Shion's character which makes it a real shame that it was actually discontinued after only three chapters for unknown reasons. Following the release of Higurashi and Matsuri, a Nintendo DS port of the series swiftly followed under the title of Higurashi Kizuna, or Bonds, consisting of four games released between 2008 and 2010, 
Kizuna included the ten arcs from Matsuri and the visual novel version of Yoigoshi, as well as a further new arc I'll mention later, but most notably added the advanced story, which itself later received a two-volume manga adaptation. Some Utsushihen, or the Stain Diffusion chapter, and Kage Boshihen, or the Silhouette chapter, act as an extended adaptation of Oni Sarashihen. These arcs explore two different versions of and ultimate conclusions to the story we know from the manga in something loosely resembling a question and answer arc structure, but with various new additions. The biggest of these comes in the form of the advanced story's protagonist, Tomoe Minai a detective who finds herself drawn into the strange goings-on that follow the Hinamizawa gas disaster. The story continues into Toki Hogushihen, or the Untangling chapter, wherein we discover Tomoe also investigated various incidents to do with Rena's breakdown in Ibaraki, and concludes in Miyotsukushi Ura, which was later incorporated into a master version of the arc involving both the Hinamizawa and Kakiuchi, or Omote and Ura storylines. I have slightly complicated feelings about the advanced story, so I'll get the negatives out of the way first. Much of the story takes the form of a cop drama crossed with a political thriller, neither of which particularly appeal to me personally, and the writing does have a tendency to become rather convoluted, bogged down with detail, and hard to follow. Then there's the slightly too heavy focus on carceral justice for my personal comfort, though it should be noted that there's at least a little nuance to this discussion present. There is also a piece of retconning regarding an element of the original series which will be very minor to most, but that I could have done without. I'll explain what I mean here in the description for those who don't mind being spoiled. What all of this boils down to is a distinctly grounded story that may well appeal more to some than the original, which deals with a myriad of topics from political corruption to medical scandal to police conduct. There's plenty of thematic crossover with the main series here, with the idea being to look at how all of these things impact a society's most vulnerable citizens, in this case the mentally ill. The only thing that really leads me to actively recommend the advanced story, however, is its characters and their individual journeys. Despite initial apprehensions, I became deeply invested in Tomoe's arc in particular, as she grapples with the tragedy of losing her parents to a house fire at a young age, and how this impacts her relationship with her younger sister as they are driven apart by their grief. When we meet Tomoe, she's going on 30, having followed her father into the police force with the ultimate goal of uncovering the conspiracy that she believes led to the death of her parents. The advanced story ultimately works because it has no real agenda only the goal of exploring one woman's journey to find meaning and purpose in the wake of trauma. Nothing new then, Figurashi. While Tomoya was the highlight of the advanced story for me, Natsumi's arcs and their focus on friendship carried some equally poignant moments that wouldn't have felt out of place in the main series, and any interactions between the two were likewise highlights. The advanced story is one of those things that's likely to draw different reactions out of different people, but the experience it offers is both a complete and fulfilling one. I would recommend people read and make up their own minds about these arcs, just maybe not as a priority. Along with Yoigoshi and the advanced story, Kizuna also gave us Koto Hogushihen, or the congratulating chapter. Koto Hogushi began life as a few scenes in the Matsuri or PS2 version of Miyotsukushi, the one following the club but was ultimately separated out into its own lengthy arc which acts as Hanyu's origin story. Koto Hogushi begins with Hanyu's arrival in Hinamizawa, and takes us through her marriage into the Hurude family, the birth of her daughter Orka, and finally the events that led to her death. It's one of the arcs on this list that 7th Mod are still in the process of translating, but from what I've read about it, it already seems likely to be one of the most worthwhile entries to this list full of moving moments and sure to be of interest to those who are curious about the history of Hinamizawa, the series Law, or, of course, Hanyu herself. As part of various bonuses bundled with the Kizuna games, a few different drama CDs were released, all between one and two hours long. These are fairly run-of-the-mill, slice-of-life scenarios that are more fun than important to the series at large, but they still have plenty of lovely moments that make them worth the listen. Murakuzushihen, or the village collapsing chapter, features Natsumi visiting Hinamizawa during the festival and spending time with the club, 
Makoto Ushihen or the Distant Happiness chapter has the club fight over a magical doll that can grant any wish, and Yume Kawashihen or the Dream Crossing chapter sees the club visit a hot springs said to grant the bather with great intelligence, due to Mion's worries regarding her upcoming entrance exams. This last one is of particular note as it takes place in the winter of 1983, making it one of the only arcs to depict the club beyond summer of the same year. While the Kizuna games were being released, the Higurashi manga managed to sneak in yet another new arc in the form of Kokoro Yashihen, or the heart healing chapter, illustrated by Yuna Kagesaki. In Kokoro Yashi, the club decide to take a trip to Tokyo during their summer vacation, but their failure to obtain permission from their various parents and guardians leave them resorting to characteristically unorthodox measures. The arc ultimately does exactly what it says on the tin providing a heartwarming and healing excursion, the likes of which is always welcome after how much suffering the series puts both its characters and readers through. Save this one for when you need something to make you smile for an hour and know it will be an hour well spent. Around the same time, we also got Higurashi-chan, literally Higurashi Mahjong, a, uh, well, PSP Mahjong game. Jan has a loose story which resulted in two separate adaptations, one one-volume manga wherein the club simply play mahjong after school, and the alternative two-volume tsubame gaishihen wherein Keiichi succumbs to Hinomizawa syndrome whilst still playing lots of mahjong because priorities. Jan also came packaged with a drama CD titled Koke Odoshihen or the Bluff Chapter. It's 2011, and Higurashi has a new OVA. Higurashi Kira, or Higurashi Sparkle, as previously mentioned, is somewhat infamous amongst fans, and I am here to play the thankless role of trying to redeem it. I would bet a good deal of Kira's bad press comes from its decision to make Batsu Koishi its first episode, which, let's be clear, is an absolute blight on the series, and probably scared a lot of people away from watching the rest of it. While I'm entirely sympathetic, I'd like to make it known that the other three episodes are actually really decent. Ayakashi Senshihen, or the demon battling chapter, sees Satoko and Rika enter an alternate universe where it turns out they are magical girls who fight the evil Tokyo Magica with the help of their friends. This is the most meh episode of the three that are actually worth watching, but that's not to say it isn't just as cute and fun as it sounds and it's also exactly the kind of Satoko Rika content we all need right now. Musubi Aishihen, or the Affinity Chapter, however, is even better. The story follows Rena, Mion, and Shion as they each try to win the affections of the oblivious Keiichi, which may sound like your standard harem fare, but the arc carries some genuinely poignant character moments to pair with its buckets of ship fodder. I was pleasantly surprised with this OVA touching in particular on Shion's complicated feelings towards Keiichi, in light of the duty she feels to both Satoshi and her sister over ensuring her own happiness. And I think it's fair to say it ultimately tilts in favour of Keimi, so it's another must for fans of the pairing. Finally, Satoko and Rika's adorable antics throughout the episode are amusingly reminiscent of a certain pair of chaotic lesbians. The real hidden gem of the Kira OVA, though, is Yume Utsushihen, or the Dream Appearing chapter, also able to be translated as the Trance or Reality and Dream chapter. In Yume Utsushi, a young Rika enters a magical shrine that teleports her to 1983, where Hanyu stumbles across her. This is another welcome story of the club simply whiling away a summer's day together as they try and find a way to send Rika back in time. What it also presents, however, is an opportunity for the present-day Rika and Hanyu to interact with the former while she's still genuinely a child, blissfully unaware of all that awaits her. By the time this episode had wrapped up, it had managed to get more than a few tears out of me, and I had, until recently, considered it to be a genuinely quite beautiful conclusion to the main series. We're not there quite yet, though, because in 2014, 7th expansion released Higurashi Ho. I know, I'm getting there. Higurashi Ho, or Higurashi Gift, was a further repackage of all the PC arcs released so far, that's the 11 included in Re, with an additional three new scenarios, released as a gift to fans, because Rukishi really looked at all of this and said, hmm. 
not enough. This is the version of the series Manga Gamer are in the process of localising, so all of these arcs should eventually be out on Steam, though we have no idea when. It is also the title of the most recent Higurashi console ports for the Nintendo Switch and PS4, which include every arc released for the series in visual novel format so far across both consoles and PC, a staggering 23. The first of Ho's quote-unquote new arcs, Hinamizawa Teryujo or Hinamizawa Bus Stop, was actually first released as a one-volume manga illustrated by Tomozo and is based on Higurashi's prototype stage play. The story is set, you guessed it, at a bus stop on the outskirts of Hinamizawa, where two characters by the names of Rika Hurude and Mion Sonozaki encounter various strangers seeking shelter from the rain who share stories about the upcoming project to submerge the village, and the rumoured curse that has struck those involved. While much of this will sound familiar, our two leads themselves are not quite the Rika and Mion we know. In Teiryujo, they are roughly the same age as one another, and have fairly different personalities. The story still reads very much like a stage play with its many theatrics, and was even adapted into one by a professional troupe though the moments of psychological horror will nonetheless feel uncomfortably familiar. For this reason, I think the arc is best experienced in its visual novel form, as more is left to the imagination, and some fantastic music really aids in creating atmosphere. Anyone who opts to read the manga should consider themselves warned, as it's even more gory than what Higurashi fans may be used to, and depicts its many scenes of violence in excruciating detail. A downside to this version of the story also comes in its uncomfortably sexualised art. This aside, Teiryujo is one of my higher recommendations from this list, with the real highlight coming in the form of its heavy gay overtones, the relationship between Nika and Mion being the arc's central focus. Teiryujo is perfect if you're looking for a story you can completely immerse yourself in for just an hour or two, both captivating and hard to forget. The second news story from Hor, Outbreak, may be better known to fans through its OVA, which technically released the year before the visual novel version. Outbreak is a Higurashi zombie apocalypse story, because why the fuck not? In Outbreak's universe, Hinamizawa becomes cut off from the rest of the world after the spread of a strange virus. I'm glad I've never experienced that. When the frantic villagers turn to violent mob behaviour, the club resolve to escape Hinamizawa with their families, even if they have to risk their lives trying to do so. As Higurashi fans, we're used to seeing these characters clash with one another, and so the most gratifying thing about Outbreak is how it allows the cast to unite against an opposing force, and demonstrate the strength of their family-like bond in the process. It won my complete suspension of disbelief, right around when I got to see Keiichi and Lena collectively go absolutely apeshit because someone hurt me on. Beyond the chaos and slight ridiculousness, the story carries its fair share of tender moments I really enjoyed, and I can thoroughly recommend checking out both versions. When we got to Outbreak's cliffhanger ending, I even found myself wanting to know what happened next which is why I was actually pretty excited when I found out Ho's only entirely new scenario was a continuation of the same story. Kami Kashi Mashihen, or the Boisterous Gods chapter, picks up with the club having made it to Okinomiya, where they have hopes of finding Shion and taking shelter with the Sonozaki group. The situation is by this point pretty dire, with failures to contain the virus leading to rapid societal collapse the journey across the city becoming incredibly dangerous as a result. Okay, by this point I was becoming genuinely invested in the Outbreak storyline, but this is obviously all very far removed from the original story, and I guess Yukishi wanted to wrap it up properly, so Kami Kashimashi makes sure to do this in a very bizarre fashion. I don't particularly mind that the ending to this arc basically makes this whole storyline into a comedy, I just wish it had been done differently. Things quieten down a bit for Higurashi in the latter half of the 2010s, and the steady stream of new content finally dried up. A new patchy slot machine was released with the addition of Mawari Musubihen, or the circular conclusion chapter, but all these machines actually have, by way of storytelling, are short cutscenes, so nothing to write home about there. That wasn't all though. In 2020, it was announced that Higurashi would be receiving a smartphone-based gacha game titled Higurashi Mei, or Life. 
Higurashime isn't available in English, which is unfortunate as it has an ongoing original story written once again by Kichi Kano that also seems to have at least some bearing on a certain other ongoing Higurashi property. Mir follows a new character by the name of Kazuho Kimiyoshi who visits Hinamizawa ten years after the gas disaster and ends up being sent back to 1983 where, along with the club, she meets two other mysterious girls by the name of Miyuki Akasaka and Nao Hotani. Mei incorporates various of the series' side characters, from Tomoe and the soon-to-be-added Natsumi, to Tamura Himeno Mikoto, who was introduced in Kamikashi Mashi, and Miyabi Sayonji from Mawari Musubi. That's all I can really say about Mei for now, as the story seems likely to continue for some time. And that's it, we made it to the end. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah, I'm joking. And so we arrive at last at Higurashi Go. In 2019, it was announced that there would be a new Higurashi anime project. And I thought, oh cool, a new OVA. <laughs> when we finally got our first trailers the following year, it looked to be, for all intents and purposes, a reboot of the original by relatively unknown and new studio Passione, but still written by Yukishi. Higurashi Go is not a remake, as we all now know well, though Yukishi states the series is newcomer friendly, to which I would say only if you are happy to be spoiled on the entirety of the original and not have most of the context for what's going on. If you haven't watched Go yet and you've miraculously managed to stave off spoilers, you should probably click away from this video now. I have been asked my thoughts on Gore pretty much every day since it started airing, and it's never gotten any easier to say something definitive. When I realised this was not the remake we had assumed it to be, I became very nervous. Even as the series continued to branch off in all different directions, the future of the Matsuri Bayashi fragment where the story had come to rest had all but been left alone in what I had come to take as a kind of rule that we, the audience, would never see what lay beyond 1983, even as Rika did. And I liked it that way. I was entirely happy with the original ending. I didn't want anything to mess it up. Go is interesting because my experience of it has been completely shaped by what I bring to the show as a fan of this series, and I think it knows that. Be it the way the realisation that I'd have to see these characters suffer again made me feel despair bordering on nausea, or the horribly surreal tinge the horror takes on specifically from seeing Rika re-enter this distorted reality, we together were so sure she'd left behind. I wrought a lifetime's worth of lessons out of Higurashi, then carried them all with me into adulthood trusting the world I drew them from to remain in stasis for me to return to every time I needed to learn them again. Instead, I was forced to confront the fact that time marches ruthlessly on. I knew the point of Matsuri Bayashi was not to give the characters this perfect, happy ending wherein they would never again experience hardship, but I also didn't think I would have to see it when they did. We look for happy endings in stories because we know real life is not so kind. No, we do not get one happy ending, but rather thousands interwoven with just as much sadness. We keep casting the dice in search of the fleeting moments where everything feels okay, knowing they will not last. That's why Gore works for me because it understands that 1983 isn't just slipping out of reach for Satoko, but for the audience, too. It understands how scary that is for both of us. It understands that scars fade but do not disappear, and that hurt people hurt people, and that we fight and we fight and we fight to be happy. It's Higurashi, then, through and through. Nothing more, nothing less. Perhaps ironically, Higurashi is a series that just does not want to die. 
Even beyond the scope of this video, there's yet more miscellaneous bonus content in the form of various manga, CDs, and even multiple defunct mobile games. Most recently, an HD port of the original PC game was announced under the title of Higurashi Ho Plus, with the promise of yet another brand new short scenario. But Okishi made clear in an interview just the other day that he will keep returning to this series so long as he feels that there are stories left to tell. But in just a few months, Go's story will continue on into Higurashi Suds. Together, the kanji from these two titles combine to mean graduation. To move forwards. To move on. I don't know what it's like to be a Higurashi fan without the constant promise of something new. A string of tickets back into a world I don't think many of us quite know how to leave. The years I've spent drifting from and being pulled back into the orbit of this story now threaten to outnumber the years I spent never knowing it existed, and it's hard to think of a time when its impact on my life wasn't evident. We've been spoiled as fans of this series, and I can't say whether that's a good thing. After all, as I've shown, Higurashi isn't perfect. Far from it. It's easy to look at it as a franchise, and its many appendages as the product of something that has been prolonged far past its sell-by date. I won't deny that might be true for some of them, and much of my apprehension towards Go and Sotsu come from my wondering if this story shouldn't have just been left alone all those years ago, when it was written by one person with one clear thing to say. Of course, if you're a fan, you'll know exactly how un higurashi esque that description is. Stories aren't so simple. They're written by humans, after all. And that's why I'll wait for July. Scared. Hopeful. Grateful to care enough to feel those things. Grateful to this person I've never met for making this strange, sprawling, heart-wrenching, all-consuming, imperfect thing that changed my life forever. And so I hope I've convinced you there's probably still something left for you, too, in this veritable mess of a media property. Something that you didn't know you were looking for, or didn't know you needed, waiting to be found. I've given you the map, but it's up to you where you let it take you next. So what are you waiting for? Go and see what else Hinamizawa has to offer you. If you're still listening to me, I have a feeling it isn't done with you quite yet. <laughs>